Hello and welcome to the NC Podcast. My name is Natasha Collins and I'm the host of this podcast. I'm also the founder of NC Real Estate, which includes its phenomenal members club for landlords and property investors to come and build profitable property portfolios that completely align with their goals. I want you to know something. On Monday the 30th of November, I'm going to be doing another webinar which I want you to come to. It's called Confused on How to Build Your Perfect Property Investment Strategy? Uncover the secret source to building a profitable property portfolio. We are going to be going through that between 6.30 and 7.30 p.m. I am going to put the link below so that you can sign up to that. It's ncrealestate.co.uk forward slash webinar November 2020. But You don't need to remember that. Just click on the link below this podcast recording and you'll go straight there. Really is as simple as that. So do make sure that you come and join me. Spaces are going to be limited because I want to make sure that um, we have an intimate chat where we go through everything. I'm so excited for it. What you will have noticed this year is that I'm running out a whole host of new webinars. So this is one of them please come and join me. We are going to go through uncovering the secret source to building a profitable property portfolio. Come and join me. Okay, how are you doing this week? Are you good? Uh, If you're watching on YouTube, you'll be like, "Uh, Natasha, not in my regular getup. It's a Sunday morning. I'm recording this. I am in my, I'm going to go and walk my dog clothes. So (laughs) if you're watching this on webinar, on YouTube, sorry. Hey, this is me. Hi, how are you doing? Happy Sunday morning, although this will go out on Tuesday. Last week was a super long week. Business-wise at NC Real Estate, it just seemed like the team and I had so much going on. We're trying to do an awful lot of things, get everything ready. If you didn't know, I have been building my team over the last couple of months. I have different team members on board. I've just onboarded my new personal assistant. Dragonette is awesome. She's helping me with emails and scheduling and making sure that everything goes out okay. I've got Diana who runs my marketing. Um, I have Lorenza who really is my right hand woman, but she is a community manager in the members club. She also does um, a lot of the operational things as well around launches and um all of our outreach activities. She does all of that. She is phenomenal in the members club. I cannot thank Lorenza enough for all of the work she does with my clients to support me as well. Um, We have Chanel who does all the designing, all the pretty stuff, making making sure that all of our handouts and everything look lovely. And we have Eva who does our Facebook ads. So And we've also got Jenny in accounts as well. Jenny has now come on board for NC accounts. She she runs all of the day-to-day things, statements, anything that any of our clients needs in regards to accounts. So I have a very big team now. And last week was the first time that everybody started getting together and working together. Inevitably, that leads to operational (laughs) difficulties not difficulties it's just everybody trying to fit to fit in make sure that they're working together people are on different time zones Um, and so last week went a lot slower than I'd planned for and I didn't really have much downtime we had a lot going on a lot of things that we're trying to sort out just because the business is growing how awesome is that the business is growing we've been able to do this it just means that in that transitional phase, things don't go quite the way we would like them to go all of the time. So and last week was busy because of that. And on Friday, I found myself just needing to take a couple of hours out. When I take a couple of hours out, I go and um, tend to get my nails done because then I can't look at my phone and I can just sit and think. And I also got my hair done and I, I just needed a couple of hours out. And afterwards, I went for a cup of tea in a bakery and just sat there and just breathed for half an hour because I could not could not get my thoughts together about what what was going on what we needed to do going forward and so just taking that time out was great I also couldn't think about what I wanted to put in this podcast for the first time ever I lost my words so 
And this is why it's Sunday morning, I'm feeling good, I've been sleeping a lot this weekend, and I thought, yes, this is the time to come to you guys. One of the big things that's happened over the last couple of weeks, if you remember in last week's podcast, I said that we just got finance for a property purchase in Charleston. Well, guys, we're now under offer on a property. <laughs> happened really quickly, but the story was that last Saturday, our realtors took a, Chris and I out for a lot of viewings on different properties in our area um, to see what we liked and what we didn't like. And we, we went through loads and loads of different properties all around James Island in Charleston. This is the area that we came and this is where our current Airbnb is. And we just fell in love. It's really beautiful down here, close to the beaches. There's a lot of amenities, so shopping, a lot of um, good recreational activities, so beaches, trails, um, pubs, takeaways, restaurants, really good around here. Um, and we'd kind of had this idea that we would like something similar to the Airbnb that we are in now, but there was nothing on the lake that we're on on the market. So we just didn't, didn't think that it was a possibility for us. But after a day of looking around, We'd seen some really interesting properties, properties that were similar to this, but in a different location, but nothing that really, you know in your gut when you get that feeling that you're just like, this is my property. No, none of that. So Saturday evening, we came back and we just sat on the porch reading and I looked across the lake and there is a beautiful house across the lake with a gorgeous dock that I go past when I paddleboard and I think, oh, that is absolutely beautiful. I would love that house. But there's never been anybody there, apart from last Saturday evening, when I saw people wandering around like they were doing a viewing. And of course, I've been in property long enough to know when people are doing a viewing. So um, I had a look up and I said to Chris, Chris, they're taking pictures of that property. I think that, pro that property's on the market. He's like, uh, really? So, I opened up uh, Zillow and I was like, yeah, this property came to the market today and it's on $25,000 over what we had originally budgeted. I said, but oh my gosh, look at it, it's beautiful. I said, I have to get our realtors over there. We have to go and have a look. So I got in contact with Ali and Kaylin, who are our realtors and said, guys, you have to get me around tomorrow morning. I need to go and see this property. I think this is our property. They laughed because it was overpriced and they said, oh, it's quite tricky. There's a lot of buzz around this property. A lot of people want to go and see it. So 10 a.m. the next morning, we queue up to go around it. There's lots of people there. You have to go in at your own slot. Of course, we're social distancing right now. Uh, you can't have too many people in there at a time. It's just you and your realtor who can go in the property. And when you're seeing properties, they've got uh, the key locks on the doors. So the your realtor plus you go in, open up, and you can have a wander around, then you have to close the house back up before the next party can go in. So we were waiting outside for about 45 minutes and I went inside and we had a look around and I was like, yes, this is the house we have to buy. This would make a perfect, 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 perfect Airbnb. But before that, we would love living here as well. I didn't even need to really see the whole of the property. I didn't really care what condition it is. You know when you get that gut feeling? And I've done a lot of research about what um, the income would be on this Airbnb, the fact that we wouldn't have to live in, we wouldn't have to rent it out all of the time on Airbnb. We could still use it as a holiday house as and when we're back here. So I was like, this is perfect. They were like, come on, come and see other properties. They were trying to say to me, Natasha, there are so many people looking around this. We don't know if we're gonna get it for you. We went and saw another property and I was like, no, I have to have that house. I have to have this house, it's perfect. It's on the lake, it's got a private dock. It has three bedrooms, three en suites, gorgeous living area. There's a separate office off of one of the bedrooms. Um, there's a two living rooms, a lounge area, good size kitchen, big gar garage so we can put charging in for the electric car. It was perfect and 
I said, we have to do this. How do we make this work? First of all, I had to get on the phone back to where's our mortgage broker and say, hey, could we borrow up to um, $425,000? Because uh, Kaylin, who's our lead realtor, she had said, look, we have to offer an ask. There are far too many people going around this property. I was like, fine. Okay, so phone wears, he was like, yeah, not a problem. It's only gonna cost $30 more a month if you up it to 425, you guys are approved, you can do that. Then we had to put together a asking, an offer strategy. So we put in our full price offer, our full ask offer, sorry, that we would also do our due diligence over 10 days. So what happens in America is that you put an offer in on the property once it's accepted. Um, both parties sign the contract, that's it, you're under offer. No one else can put in an offer, no one else can go and look at it, it's yours. You then have a period of time where you can go and do your due diligence. And in that period of time, if your due diligence comes back that it's not a great property, you can pull out of the property, it goes back on the market. In order to do that as well, you put down, um, a small deposit into escrow which is held with your closing attorneys and that can be that minimum that should be as one percent of the purchase price but you can offer more to show your commitment if you pull out that comes back to you and what we also said was that we would put down an extra five hundred dollars whereby if we pulled out in those 10 days we we said we wanted 10 days for due diligence we would pay the seller five hundred dollars you know for any inconvenience caused then Kaylin also said to me, Natasha, write them a letter. Write them a letter and tell them why you want the property. So I did that as well. I said that I've been looking at this property every day. It's directly opposite um, our property that we're living in right now. We're in Airbnb. We want permanent accommodation and we love it. We really, really love it. I told them about our family, that we were from the UK. Um, and based upon that whole offer, they accepted last Sunday evening. I knew we weren't gonna get anything better. I really knew it in my heart of hearts. I knew we weren't gonna get anything better. And that was super exciting. Then all of this week, we've had to do the due diligence. On Wednesday, we did the inspection. So the building survey, the equivalent of a building survey, they went round, they did, they did the inspection, told us everything that was wrong with the property. Um, again, very similar to what happens in the UK. There wasn't that much wrong with this property, thank goodness. We also had to have our flood insurance done. Obviously, we're, we're on the coast in Charleston. It is a flood area. The property we're buying is three foot, is raised by three foot. So as well as being, you know, in outside of a floodplain area, it's also a raised property. So that's really good. We got some cheap flood insurance. Flood insurance is gonna be $420 per year. We also got building insurance. Building insurance is far more expensive, a couple of thousand dollars a year. That's all tied in with our monthly expenditure um, as quoted by the, the mortgage broker. And all we're waiting for is our termite and dam inspection tomorrow morning. And then once that's done, as long as that comes back fine, we're signed off. We will complete on this on the 14th of December. So it's been a really busy week because I'm learning about the process of buying a property for ourselves in the US. But I really, really am excited by the numbers because I'm gonna tell you what this, this looks like right now. Let me get it up. Okay, so here's how it looks right now. Offer accepted at 425,000 pounds. All of our cost to buy plus deposit, $28,750. Um, and sorry, offer accepted at $425,000. <laughs> so that's around about £23,000. Monthly expenses are $2,115. That's a 2.875% interest and repayment mortgage fixed for 30 years. The only thing that I've not factored into that is management. So I need to have a look at what that, what that will be, but we don't need it managed because we'll be living there whilst we do it up. Due diligence that I've done suggests on average of $211 per night for 69% of the year based on 200, that's based on this year's stats. So with COVID, 
which means that we'd be generating roughly $4,428 per month, which means that we're looking at roughly $2,300 net per month. Good, right? Really, really good. I'm very excited about it. As long as everything goes fine tomorrow, great, we'll progress and I'm going to get all of the quotes for contractors. Once we've finished, I'm going to put all of this together of how much it's cost us, um, what the process is, and then I'll share that with you. Um, really, really interested, very, very excited. I'm so, 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 so happy that this is going ahead. So that's our update for you on what we are buying right now. So let's move on to the key topic of this webinar. What's wrong with my strategy? Okay, I get asked so often, how can I be sure that I'm analyzing deal in the right way? How do I know if I'm making the right choices in my property investment journey? I feel jittery, I feel so unsure. How do I know what kind of mortgage to go with? I don't feel sure about which finance to go with and what aligns with my goals. I feel lost about what property to buy next, where it should be. A flat, a house, is my HMO a deal? I'm struggling to find deals that actually stack up. Maybe you're wondering whether to purchase in the current climate for potential property values. How do you know if you've spotted the right deal regardless of strategy? How do I understand a deal properly, right? All the time, that's what I hear all of the time. And then, Ultimately, it's what's wrong with my strategy? Why am I not making as much progress as, I don't know, insert name of whatever social media influencer in property investing you wanna put in there right now? It's a lot, isn't it? So, 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 so much. And for a lot of people, this just overwhelm about what to do next is, I don't know, it's just deliberating, it's so, so frustrating. And so I wanted to cover the question, what is wrong with my strategy? Should we start with something that I like to do quite often, just so that I keep abreast of what's going on in the depths of the property investment industry, because I understand that for a lot of people, when they get started out here, or even when they just don't know what to do next, you can head to Google and start looking through Google of, okay, you know, perhaps Google will help me find an answer. So all I did was type property investment strategy UK into Google, right? And a lot has come up. So I've got one here, 70K to invest, 12% net returns, right? Um, I've got the top eight property investment strategies, standard vanilla single occupancy buy to let, HMOs, buy to sell, property lease options, delayed completions, commercial to residential conversions, joint ventures or GAV syndication, deal packaging, holiday lets, commercial property, single lets to tenants on benefits. Jesus. Um, off plan property, interesting. Um, interesting, um, HMO investments come up a lot, get average 8% annual yield, beating the UK average of 3 to 5%, interesting. I've got a load of books as well here that you can get. Property investment for beginners, 100 property investment tips. Build a rental property empire. Rental property investing. The ABCs of real estate investing. And the list goes on. I mean, it's overwhelming, right? How would you even know? I mean, there's a lot of blogs out here that say which property investment strategy is right for you, question mark, and then obviously have their answers underneath. One thing I want to make very clear about all of this, and when you're Googling, what's wrong with my strategy? What can I do next? What is it? 
HMO is not a strategy. Service accommodation, not a strategy. Commercial property, not a strategy. Buy, refurbish, refinance, could be a strategy. What else is that? Commercial to residential conversion could be a strategy, right? You're probably thinking, Natasha, you've gone mad. Why are you saying these things aren't a strategy? Because if I just, if you said to me, Natasha, what's your property investment strategy? And I turn around and said to you, well, buy to let, bit of service accommodation, some developments. Is that a strategy? No, it's not. That's just a list of the types of properties that I'm investing in right now. It's not a strategy. Not in any way is that a strategy. So when I'm asking people, you know, well, what is your strategy? They say, oh, well, I do service accommodation. Great. What is the strategy behind that? How are you building that portfolio? What's the growth strategy? How are you planning on making sure that you have money in the bank and that you can afford every eventuality? How are you getting through COVID? What's your strategy there? How are you managing it? What's your strategy there? You know, for me, if I, I've just told you what I invest in, right? You have no idea what my strategy is behind that. Nothing, nothing whatsoever because it's meaningless. It's just a type of property. Saying a type of property is not a bloody strategy. Okay, that's why for the first part, what's wrong with your strategy? You're just naming types of property. That's number one. That's what's wrong with your strategy. I think we need to call that a day because those aren't strategies. Now, why do I say that commercial to residential conversion may be a strategy? Well, it's showing you what the change is. It's showing you what the transformation is. And that is part of a strategy. Um, the same as if you have this net yield guide, yeah, part of a strategy. Now, full disclosure, I have never seen any property with 12%, oh no, it's 12% net return. Could mean anything, it really could mean anything. They just chuck out big numbers. Honestly, don't believe it until you've gone and done your own due diligence. But what I'm trying to say to you is probably the biggest thing that's wrong with your strategy is the fact that you have not put in place a strategy for the next however long you're planning on being in the property industry. Now, I'm not saying you have to be in the property industry full time or anything. Uh -uh, definitely not. What I'm saying is, is that property investment is long term. Really it is. Um, and I intend to be investing in property probably for the rest of my life. And as you can probably tell from the first part of this podcast, I invest in things that I'm really, really passionate about and that I love and that there is absolutely no situation where I wouldn't have bought that property at a good price. Now you may say, Natasha, you put in a, uh, an offer at asking price. Well, yeah, because the property down the road sold two weeks ago at 499 and it's the same size, right? So I got a good price. Did you ask me that before? No, did I tell you that? No, I didn't. So there you go, that's a strategy. I'm buying well, I'm buying properties that I love and they're making a really good income. I'm passionate about it, I'll move forward. The whole plan is to eventually buy retirement whenever Chris and I decide to retire is that we have a huge amount of money coming into our bank accounts. Do I have a cap on that? Not really. Where do I want to get to? I mean, 10,000 pounds and dollars from both sides of the Atlantic would be really great on a monthly basis with pretty much unencumbered portfolios. Are we working towards that? Yes, we are. That would be my strategy, but how am I gonna get there? Well, actually, that's my goal. That's what I'm trying to achieve. How am I trying to get there? Well, through a strategy. And when I put together a strategy, I look at how assets are growing, how I'm going to be funding those assets, and that can be your own cash, it can be cash from within your portfolio, it can be investor finance, it can be joint venture finance, whatever you want to do. But what you really need to do when you're strategizing your property investment strategy when you're putting it together is start from what do I have now and I 
trying to drum this into you because so many people skip this over in favor of, nah, I just do service accommodation. No, you don't. It's not a strategy. That's not your strategy. Go in deeper. I, it really makes me absolutely turn off when I say to some, oh, what's your strategy? Oh, vanilla buy to let's. Fabulous, that's just what you do. It's not a strategy. It's not a strategy because you're not telling me where you get your money from. You're not telling me who you're investing with. You're not telling me how that's growing. That's not a strategy. It's just what you do in one word or a couple of words. So first, here's what I want you to do. You start with what you've got now. How can you make that grow? How does that grow over the time period? Secondly, you then look at what you want your dream property portfolio to look like. What income does it need to be generating? How much does it need to be worth? Um, what sorts of properties are you going to be putting in there? And then you map the gap. What are you, coming, what are you getting in on a monthly basis? What are you putting into your property portfolio on a monthly basis? And here is a huge hint. Most property investors who are in this long term are putting into their property investment pot from multiple different sources. If you think that property investors spend five years, they build a property portfolio and they never keep investing into it, and that's that, they're now living their life, I don't know, whatever. Um, number one, that's incredibly boring. It sounds dull as dishwater. Number two, it means that they got to a goal and they don't have any more dreams. Boring, boring. And most property investors don't do that. They seriously don't do that. They're always looking at growth. You do not want a stagnating property portfolio. You do not. If you have that, what's the point? Assets are meant to grow. Assets really are meant to grow. So, you need to have a plan in place for that growth. You need to have a plan in place for how you're going to fund this property portfolio. And really for most investors, me included, we have multiple different streams of income. I have income coming in from my business, from my lecturing, from other consulting gigs that I do sometimes, from my property portfolio in both countries, right? That's how I make over six figures a year and I invest the majority of it back into my property portfolio. Yes, I work hard, but I enjoy working hard. And that's how I would grow quicker and be able to buy these properties that I absolutely love, rather than scrimping and saving for a 50 grand property that's gonna generate, what, 350 pound a month and not gonna grow. Okay, so we need to be thinking about this. How do we build and build and build? So, every single month, you then need to be mapping out what's coming in, for example, all of the money going into your property investment pot, what's going out, so your expenditure on properties, and how does that add up so that you can buy another property? Or if you map this out long term, when could you take investment and when could you afford to pay that back? If you then get that right, you can map out your current portfolio, how that's growing, and then your dream portfolio, add that onto the end, map that all together, have a lengthy enough cash flow, which then shows you exactly what happens at each step of your property acquisition process. It also doesn't limit you to just one type of property. You know, if say you mapped out that this year, you were going to buy two properties, one at the start of the year, one at the end of the year, although I appreciate it, we're coming to the end of 2020, so maybe 2021. In between that time, you know you've got enough money coming in that you could get either training or learning on another property type, or you could hire professionals in to advise you on it. You can forecast that in your cash flow rather than always thinking, I am just constantly skimmed because I am putting all of my money in here, all these properties aren't making me enough money, I'm not doing this fast enough. You can forecast for when something works for you and when you could give up that job if you wanted and move to be a consultant. Or, you know, there are people out there who do live off their property portfolios but those property portfolios are constantly growing so that they're not stagnating. This is what you have to do in order to put together a strategy that works. If you don't have that, that's what's wrong with your strategy because you cannot visualize what's going to happen going forward. You cannot. 
see where you'd be able to buy that next property. And if you cannot see that, how can you make a plan? I work on the basis that you put together a shopping list for your portfolio. And you may not always have to buy those properties. You may decide to buy something else. I did not know that I was going to buy that property in Charleston, seriously. We didn't know, it's not forecasted. But if all we had to spend was 22,000 pounds in the UK, 23,000 pounds in the UK, perfect. Happy to take that money out of my other property portfolio and invest it here because of the amount of money that we're going to be making, right? Things also change, but you can change them in that cash flow strategy to reflect what's going on currently and the fact that your goals will change and they'll get bigger. It also allows you to track your progress so you can see how much change has happened over the last couple of months, 12 months, two years, five years, 10 years, however you want to do that. That is what is so vital to your success as a property investor. If you don't have that, again, that's what's wrong with your strategy because you have no direction for what is coming next. So I will repeat the process to you again. You start with your goals. What are you trying to achieve? Then where are you already? Next, what will your dream portfolio look like which will get you from where you are already to your goals? You put that in a cash flow strategy, so what's coming in and going out every month. Are you adding anything to your cash flow strategy? When is more money going into your property investment pot and you map that out for the foreseeable future? I tend to do it on a five year and 10 year basis. The outcome of this is then you know when you can buy that next property, what that next property should look like. So the purchase price that you're buying it for, the rental income that you're looking at getting, even the mortgage product that you should be using because you can map out then when you want to remortgage. So it will be a certain interest rate for a certain amount of time. You then just go and find that, right? You you know all of the, the variables of that property. So you can go and find that perfect mortgage. You know what's right for you. And if you need to remortgage in six months time, well, you know that you need to get that shorter term product. Do you see where this just absolutely gives you the steps? that you can take in order to build that property portfolio. You then know at what time you have enough money in the bank to build that property portfolio by the next property, or you can see, okay, well, I wanted to buy this property portfolio, this pro- this next property in July, 2021. I don't have enough money in the bank, so I'm gonna borrow 50,000 pounds from an investor, and I can afford to pay that back on 8% interest per year, in five years time, but I'll pay 8% per on every year out to the investor. That's what you need to do. If you haven't got that, there's no point in Googling what should be my property investment strategy. It's not gonna tell you, as we've seen, it's just gonna tell you. Commercial, standard accommodation, buy to let, not strategies. You need an actual cash flow strategy that's gonna get you from A to B, and you can clearly see how you're going to get there. Without that, that's what's wrong with your strategy. So please, please spend time as a result of this podcast looking through your current property portfolio, your current assets, and mapping out where you're trying to get to and then bridging the gap. That is going to get you your perfect property investment strategy. Which brings us back around to what I said at the beginning. If you want help with that, I'm gonna be going through this in the webinar on Monday the 30th of November, um, uncovering the secret source to building a profitable property portfolio. So if you need more help with that or you want clarification, make sure you click the link below and subscribe. Right, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. I hope it's given you some key takeaways and a thought around what you should be doing to build your property portfolio strategy. You could do any type of property you want. Really doesn't matter. You can dabble in anything. Don't listen to people who just limit you to a certain thing. It doesn't have to be like that. Try everything. Experiment until you get a property that you really, really enjoy running. Once you have that, pop it into your property portfolio. Put it as part of your strategy if you want, but you get to change, you get to experiment, you're going to grow. Grow with your portfolio and allow it to grow with you. That is where you'll have the most fun. That's where you'll start 
getting those aha moments where you know what you want to do next. Thank you for listening to me t- today. Don't forget to like, rate, review so that more people can get this podcast. I will catch up with you again very, very soon.